Hey, Jesus fans, welcome to True North Podcast, where we grow closer to God together. This podcast was brought to you by Solid Rock Church in Irving, Texas, and our host, Pastor Ed Snyder. To find out more about this podcast, visit our website at truenorthdfw.org. Now let's join Pastor Snyder in a new direction and a new destination. And welcome to True North Podcast with your host, yours truly, Pastor Snyder. Man, we've got a great session set up for you today. Uh, It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. But before that, I want to say thank you to all of our new listeners that's joining us. This is fantastic. I'm seeing the numbers go up of more downloads coming for True North Podcast. And I can't tell you how thankful you are, we are, that you are on board with us. Uh, very, very thankful because the bigger the number, the more hearts we're reaching with True North Podcast episodes. Also, great news. The book, Control the Beast, is now live on Amazon.com. We'll be putting the links in the show notes and on YouTube so you can go purchase Control the Beast. We've got a, a, a webinar coming very, very soon to follow up on the book as well as sessions starting next week on Control the Beast. We will go through the book, each chapter, and do a session. So you want to tell your friends about it, get more people connected to True North Podcast, because we're going to have a great time going over Control the Beast. All right, we'll be right back, folks. Okay, today we're going to continue into part two of the DNA of sin. Today we're going to talk about the characteristics of sin. What are the characteristics of this thing called sin in our life? The word sin has been around for as long as man, starting in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve bit into that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Sin came into our existence. We were born and shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me, according to Psalms. And so we are dealing with this thing, and as as time goes by, it is getting stronger, it is getting more prevalent, and we have got to do something about it. I know for one thing, in in strat war strategy, you've got to know who your enemy is. You've got to know their strategy. You've got to know their tactics. You need to know their arsenal. And uh, sin is an enemy of our soul, of our spirit, of our relationship with God. And so we need to understand the enemy, understand our, the strategy, understand the characteristics, understand the arsenal of sin and how it works to destroy everything it touches. So let's go. Let's get into this. The characteristics of sin. One of the characteristics, the first one is self-sufficiency instead of faith. We are people filled with the Spirit, filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in the Spirit. Uh, We have a life that is called the life of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. And so sin, when it enters in, it becomes self-sufficiency. Now, Folks, I know that I'm talking to a whole lot of people out there that has talent. You have talent that you can get things done, skill sets uh, that you have developed. But here's where we need to understand something. We need to understand the fact that those skill sets, that talent was given to you by God and no other place. He gave you the ability to learn. He gave you the ability to figure it out. He gave you the aggression, the passion to go after this and learn it to be able to do thus and so, whatever it is, whether it is learning how to woodwork, learning how to write, learning how to speak, learning how to whatever. And so therefore, uh, we become, in a sense, self-sufficient. We learn a job, we learn a trade, we learn a skill that will get us a job to be able to make money, to provide for our families. It's all, it's all a part of life. But again, we've got to remember, it's not about you. It's about him. God has given us the ability to learn what we have learned and to do what we have done. 
And so therefore, we are really not self-sufficient without God. Many people seek to be self-sufficient, uh, independent, self-governing, according to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 11 and through 14 and Proverbs chapter 30 verses 8 and 9. However, Paul clearly recognized that we are unable to claim anything for ourselves, but God makes us Again, God makes us abound to do good works, like we talked about last week in episode 21. Let's go to the scripture, and let's back up what we're talking about here through the word of God. Second Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 5 and 6, and then we will jump over to chapter 9 and verse number 8. First Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, not that we are sufficient of of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the le- uh, letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And so again, our sufficiency is from God. Chapter 9, verse 8, the Bible says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So our good works, our desire for that comes from God. Our sufficiency to have the talent and skill sets to be able to make that happen comes from God. Faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith leads us to put our hope and confidence in God. I am weak, but he is strong. Like the psalmist, we must learn to trust and not uh, trust not in self, but in God, according to Psalms chapter 20 and verse 6 through 9. Here it is in your reading. Now now know that I, the Lord, saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven and with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some uh, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They brought down and fallen, but we have risen uh, and stand upright. Save the Lord. Let the king hear us when we call. Also, I want to back that point up about faith leads us to put our hope and confidence in God from Psalm chapter 37 and verses 1 through 6. Fret not uh, thyself because of evildoers, neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. That has happened in our life sometime. We see the evil prosper. We see people that doesn't acknowledge God, that even speak against God, prosper. How does that happen? The same principle applies of the of the reigning on the just and the unjust. They may develop talent and they may have skill sets, not acknowledging where it's come from, God, but they're using those things to advance. But here's where it's at, folks. We got to remember when this all ends, when life is over. Over and we stand before the judgment throne of God, that's where the difference is going to be made. That right there at that moment, judgment's coming. And whether they have prospered and made millions of dollars here on the face of the earth, or they were the most popular person and they were the celebrity and famous and everybody knew their name, it doesn't matter. Does God know their name? That's the question. Is their name written in the Lamb's book of life? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Verse 2, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass. Here it comes. 
and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so thou uh, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and judgment as noonday. So again, folks, don't get your mind twisted that you're doing this. Don't get your mind twisted that it's all about me, 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 me. It comes from God. Yes, you may be working that talent. Yes, you may be working your skill sets, but remember where it came from. Let's have faith instead of self-sufficiency because that's where sin comes in. The characteristics of of sin. Number two is self willed. Self will is counteracted by submission. All right. The Hebrew term for sin is hasha, a h a s h a. All you Hebrew experts, I might not have pronounced that correctly. Basically, it means rebellion. All right. And in the wilderness of Psalms chapter 78 and verse five through eight in the wilderness, the Israelites disregarded God's blessing and rejected his ways. So, again, don't reject the blessing of the Lord in your life. Don't fail to recognize the blessing of the Lord in your life. In Acts chapter 7, verses 51 through 55, those who crucified Christ carried on this tradition. So, question, what are sin's result? Another question, what does it do to someone? All right. First of all, it causes evil to overpower us. Sin is the portal for evil to overpower you. Next, it dominates your mind. Your mind is darkened. Sin always, when it comes in, it'll come in innocently. It'll come in with, oh, it's not that bad. You know, doing this is, is that really a sin? I mean, come on, uh, everybody's doing it these days. It's, it doesn't, it seems harmless. That is exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden when the serpent came to Eve. Oh, look at this fruit. It, it looks so delicious. Oh, you're not going to die. Surely you're God's creation. In fact, if you will eat of this fruit, you're going to become like God's. You see the trick. You see the deception. So when we allow sin into our life, even at the smallest degree, it will darken our minds and it will progress. Next, it will dominate your will. You can't make the right choices because sin has overpowered you. Let's talk about the characteristics today of sin and what it does. It also dominates your affections. You love the world and the things that are in the world. I'm doing a preaching series, just started this past Sunday, Love, Raw and Unfiltered, and how love is the factor. Love is the power. Love for God, love for his word, love for his His church. All of that, folks, that affection that we should have for the things of God is darkened, snuffed out, Uh, And by the love of the world and the things that are in the world. Next, it totally overpowers a person's behavior. Sin dominates. It will dominate your life. It's addictive. An addiction is anything that you cannot stop doing. People talk about addiction to alcohol, addiction to drugs. Yes, that's popular. That's rampant and all of that. Addiction to pornography. Well, what about addiction for not going to church, for addiction not praying, for addiction not reading your Bible? You know, I've got busyness. I got to get this done. I got my career. I got to go. And it just slowly, slowly slips in. And pretty soon, we're overpowered. Sin is never the servant of man. Man is always the servant of sin. 
that little bitty thing that doesn't seem like it's much at all, does it really sin? Sin is sin in the eyes of God. I want you to pay attention right now. We, we're we about 15 minutes into our 30-minute our podcast, and I want you to listen very, very closely. That sin is sin in the eyes of God. It, it, you know, sometimes in the human mind, we regulate sin. We, we decide what's, what's horrible and we decide when that doesn't really matter. You know, sometimes we got people sitting on church pews for years that can't tell the truth that saved their life, but yet they will look at the person sitting on death row that has mutilated somebody, violated women and children, and they are a monster and they deserve the death penalty and all of that. Well, when God sees it, when you look through the eyes of God, that monster sitting on death row in prison is no different than the person sitting on the church pew that can't tell the truth. Sin is sin in the eyes of God. We'll be right back. Most of you may not know, I used to weigh almost 400 pounds, very out of shape, sick most of the time, in pain all the time. My mother raised me on a regimen of vitamins. She did her best to take good care of me and promote good health. Not until May of 2010, in my recliner at my house, in pain, my kids became my slaves because I just couldn't get up out of the recliner and get a glass of water. So I decided enough's enough. I'm tired of being tired, sick of being sick, and I started changing my lifestyle just smaller portions, nothing after six, and healthy food. It has been a journey of losing 160 pounds and getting back in shape. One of the things is, is I reinstituted vitamins into my life. And I want to recommend a great vitamin store in Pantego, Texas. It's called Wonderful Life Health and Vitamins. Brian Sermon is the owner, and I want to highly recommend to contact him and uh, get a good regimen of vitamins. He is extremely knowledgeable. In fact, I would call him the expert in health and vitamins. So reach out to him at one, the number one, lifehv.com or give him a call at 817-274-8853. He's located at 1543 South Bowen, Pantego, Texas. It's the Arlington, Texas area. And again, we endorse him here at True North Podcast to reach out to him and get what you need there. I promise you, you'll walk out very, very happy. If you'll mention True North Podcast, he'll give you a 10% discount. So again, wonderful health and vitamins. Pantego, Texas, reach out to Brian Sermon and get healthy, lose weight, and live longer. All right, so we're coming back now with the thought we've been talking about self-will. How it counteracted or it counteracts submission. Sin brings you under Satan's control. Now, since you are dominated by sin, it's easy for him to move you into sin of various kinds because he uh, he can't just use the system to tempt you. He has to use the same system, symptom or system to destroy you. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter two and verse two, those uh, that those people who are sinners under domination of sin are moving according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. So as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a Holy Ghost filled person, we, we've got to realize that he is our Lord and master. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, known as the Great Commission. All right. Uh, and then we'll go to Acts chapter 2, verses 36 uh, through verse 38. Here it is. Jesus, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So 
here is where we must surrender our stubborn will and humbly submit to God. Verse 36 of the second chapter of the book of Acts, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked, convicted in their heart, and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That then and still is now the most important question you will ever ask. Men and brethren, what shall I do? What can I do to get out of the bondage of sin? What can I do to get away from all of this? Then Peter said unto them, here's the answer, repent. Here's how we get out of sin. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of of sins, cancellation, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. First Peter chapter five and verse six and seven. Here's how it comes: Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that ye may exalt that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. So when we understand, ladies and gentlemen, where this all sets up at, that we can't be self-sufficient, we cannot be self-willed and expect the blessing and the power of God to flow through us and in us, we are going to be dominated by the sin of those two characteristics of sin right there. And we still got more to go. So, again, we've got to understand he cares for us. Our talent and skill sets comes from God. Next is self-seeking instead of seeking goodwill. To many are arrogant and self-willed. You, you've met those kinds. They're just arrogant. They just talk about me, 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 me. You know, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. Self-seeking. They're usually suffering from severe self-esteem issues. Romans chapter 1, verse 29 and 30, the Bible says, Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the description of someone who is self-seeking. Next is self-righteousness instead of humility. Self-righteous. Again, we're going to go to the scripture. Uh, in Romans chapter 10, verses, uh, verse 3, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. It's not about self-righteousness. It's about his righteousness. We need to seek his righteousness and not our own. Revelation chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, the Bible says, Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are, are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Wow. Boy, the scripture just hit it right there. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. You don't even realize that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It goes on to say, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I slave to anoint your eyes uh, to so that you may see. All right? Again, that's how we fix self-righteousness, is submission. Let's go into uh, a little bit here, and we're ooh, we're just about out of time. Sin of omission and commission. We talked about this last week uh, in the podcast. The sin of omission and commission. James chapter four verses seventeen in the King James version. Therefore, to him that doeth to do good and doeth it not, 
to him it is sin. Let's read that same verse of scripture from the New Living Translation. And the Bible says again, remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. All right. And just a little rehearsal, a sin of omission is the sin that is the result of not doing something God's word teaches us to do. That is called the sin of omission. It is generally used in, in contrast with the corresponding phrase, the sin of commission. And the sin that, that is a sin that, that a person actively commits. Paul contrasts these two concepts in Romans chapter 7 and verse 14 through 20. And here you go. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. It's amazing how Paul is bringing out the humanity, the spiral, the downward spiral of humanity or our flesh. For what I would that that do I not, but what I hate, that's what I do. If if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. And then it is no more that uh, that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, If I do that, I would not. It is no more that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So again, basically, he nailed it. He's telling all of us today exactly what I really want to do in God, what I really want to do, what the Word teaches me to do. I can't get it done. But what I don't want to do, what I understand that is sin in my life, That's exactly what I do. That's because we're following the flesh and not the spirit. So he's expressing his frustration with the tendencies of both types of sin. He does what he doesn't want to do and knows that is wrong. That is the sin of commission. And he doesn't do what he knows he should do and really wants to do. That is the sin of omission. All right? And again, the picture of our new nature in in conflict with the flesh uh, slash carnality. So we must combat with sin in order to make it to heaven. We got to fight that fight. We got to take it on. We got to pull the sword of the word of God out. First step to combat sin is to put on full faith in God. Then here's the remedy of of sin. Then we repent of the sin to kill it. Then we are baptized in Jesus' name to bury what we just killed, sin. Then we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues to give new life to the old man. And then we stay saved we submit wholly uh, unto his word and his daily prayer, or our daily prayer, excuse me. Acts, the, uh, Acts was the birth of the church, uh, the beginning of the church age, and this is where we're going to find salvation. If you read the book of Acts, ladies and gentlemen, and follow what the early church did, you will become just as anointed, just as powerful. And folks, you will do more things than you ever thought about doing when you are under submission and in obedience to God's word and sin is no longer a part of your life. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And I'm going to end our podcast with this thought right here, the remission of sin. And here's how I explain this. That means cancellation. When somebody is stricken with cancer and and they fight it, they have, of course, with prayer and uh, prayer for healing in the name of Jesus. And of course, they go to their doctor and they do all the treatments. And the doctor comes and says, well, guess what? Your cancer 
has gone into remission. And what's that mean? In other words, your cancer is no longer tearing down your body. It has gone into remission. It has quit working. It is not destroying. It's not eating away at the organs of your physical body. The Bible says to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. We've got to put sin in remission where sin no longer affects our spiritual man. It does not have any power over us any longer. It's no longer destroying our minds and darkening our minds. It's no longer distorting how we see things and how we do things. It clears when we when we put sin in remission, we have a clear understanding of what God wants and what God requires of us. So I want to encourage you today. I really want to encourage you, reach out, reach out to somebody. If you don't know who to reach out in your area, wherever you're listening to this, I want you to drop me an email, esnyder at truenorthdfw.org, and I will get you to somebody. I will get you to a local assembly, a church that that preaches the truth of the word of God so that you can sit down with a, a pastor and go over this again and get sin in remission where sin is no longer destroying you, your relationships, your family. You're going to be able to raise another generation of of people. Your children, your grandchildren can come up in this and know what sin does and, and come up in the righteousness of God. One more verse of scripture, Psalm chapter 5, verse 12. For the Lord will bless the righteous with favor, wilt thou compass him with a shield. Let's understand the the DNA of sin and counteract it with the weapons of warfare given to us in the word of God. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us at True North Podcast. You can find us on iHeartRadio or any other podcasting platform. If you want to have any questions, visit us at truenorthdfw.org. We'll catch y'all next week.